Okay, so welcome everyone to another session in the Global Foresight Summit 2021. Uh, this year we are hosting the summit together with the APF, the Association of Professional Futurists, and the WFR, the World Future Review, a journal on strategic foresight. Uh, and also us, fast forward. So uh, today to continue the sessions of the second day of the summit, we have with us Siseko H. Kumalo, Siseko Kumalo. Uh, so he's joining us from Pretoria in South Africa. And Siseko is a PhD candidate working in the political philosophy with a focus on belonging and national identity in South Africa. He holds a master uh, of arts in political philosophy from the University of Pretoria's Department of Political Science. And uh, he is going to be presenting his ideas and talking, discussing on the democratic futures and possibilities. And I believe that those are going to be attached or related to the context of South Africa and Africa at the, at the overall context, right, Siseko? Yes. yes. So yes. welcome to the foresight and thank you so much for joining us. We are very eager to start uh, listening to your thoughts and, and presentations and find some provocations in, in that. Thank you so much. I leave you here on stage. Thank you very much, colleague. And uh, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, it's afternoon here at home in South Africa. Um, and there's a slight change a bit um, to my paper, as has been indicated. Let me start off with a bit of some introductions. As has been indicated, my name is Sebo Kumalo. Uh, a PhD candidate in political philosophy. And a lot of the work that I do really is interested in the question of governance. Um, and of course, the question of governance as it relates to national identity, and of course, how we fashion national identity and what kinds of stories we tell ourselves about ourselves. Um, most of the work that I have published recently, so that's my current focus at the moment, but most of the work that I have published deals with the questions of institutional decolonization in higher education. And I focus quite necessarily on higher education governance in terms of how does it necessarily achieve the historical objection or the historical objectives rather of um, justice, social justice, social transformation, um, as those two components are necessarily facilitated by higher education as a sector or as a sector or as a public institution. So today, as I say, my title shifts a bit in the sense that I've added something onto the title. So it's still democratic futures and possibilities, but I've added the question of in times of crisis, because the work that I'll be doing here today reflects quite necessarily on precisely the COVID-19 pandemic and how possibly things have in some respects changed and in some respects stayed the same and in some respects in sort of regressed to more historical conceptions as it were. So I start off by necessarily indicating that COVID-19 demonstrated both the strengths and weaknesses of democratic institutions all across the globe and necessarily here on the African continent um, with of course South Africa being a case in point because of how the pandemic has affected us. Yuval, Haral, Yuval Noah Harari surfaced notable and probing questions raised in his critical objection to the measures that were being proposed by governments across the globe at the inception of the pandemic. And of course, this was in 2020, as we well know. His, anal his analysis is a, salient, is a salient one as he facilitates modes of questioning the future of democracy and the possibilities therein. While some institutions have remained critical in playing an oversight role, specifically in the third world, in contexts like South Africa, where corruption runs rampant and state parastatals are on their knees as a result of systematic looting, the historical question of the public sphere was sharply brought into focus 
under the new conditions inaugurated by the pandemic. In this paper, I am interested in the public participation of the polity, that is the citizenry, when arguably emergency responses are taking on the form of enlightened absolutism, which is defined by the limitation of the citizenry from participating in public affairs. Taking my cue from Harari, I reconsider Hannah Arendt's seminal lessing address to pose the question of the future of democracy in a globalized and globalizing context, but is arrested by real threats such as COVID-19. Simply, has the pendulum swung back to despotism and enlightened absolutism, or is the current global climate pressing us to reconsider or consider new forms of public participation in the global South? And I'm interested in this question because of the trends that we are seeing all across the globe. Um, one of those, of course, being in the United States of America, for instance, whereby the Biden administration has indicated the bedrock importance, I would suggest, of connectivity, um, as well as <clears throat> the role and function of the internet in terms of allowing necessarily um, the polity to participate not only in public affairs but also in stimulating the economy. And so, with those overarching frame, with that overarching framework and those opening remarks, I'll just dive into my um, recommendations and comments here, or sort of my ideas and thoughts this morning or this afternoon. And I suppose at a particular point in time we can be able to sort of sit through and maybe think through some of these. Now, as the world moved beyond a year of lockdowns imposed all across the globe as a way of curbing the spread of the global pandemic, I begin by reflecting on the deployment of the South African National Defense Forces here at home, looking back at the reported deaths of two civilians at the hands of law enforcement. And I guess the reason why I'm doing this sort of, I suppose, I, um, what is it, retrospective gaze is to try and understand what the implications have been and how the polity has responded to these implications. Similarly, I will also draw our attention to what we saw in the United States of America, because these two reports that came out, these two uh, reports of the citizens who were murdered, as it were, by the South African government uh, through <laughs> the law enforcement agencies, that those particular deaths occurred simultaneously as we saw um, the case of um, racial prejudice in the United States of America. And there were similar contexts and similar, there were similarities as it were between the two contexts, which again, presses the question of public participation. Now, what we saw in the United States of America was the case of a public upsurge, irrespective of the conditions that we were facing, which of course posed a number of public health issues as well as threats, but at the same time, in as much as we can acknowledge that, we've also got to acknowledge, I suppose, the historical uh, role and function of the polity and its participation in democracy. Such reflections inspire the question, will the democratic experiment survive COVID-19? Now, what we've seen again in the global north in the United States of America is an attempt to re-establish, I suppose, some level of integrity and some level of respect for democracy as institution. And this is the reason why I am posing this particular question here at home. There are a series of investigations that are currently going on into state capture, as well as other problematic issues that we've seen in terms of the lack of proper governance, as well as transparency by the leading African National Congress. My question in this respect will become clearer for the audience, as well as the reader, when I begin to detail what I understand to be a return to enlightened despotism. And of course, I will unpack this particular concept, referring back to Hannah Arendt's work, because I do believe that she did indeed do some critical work in terms of how we understand this concept. And it is, of course, as I say, a concept that I borrow from her seminal contribution at her Lessing Address of 1966. To return to a case in point that I am most familiar with then, as a way of setting up my contribution, I elect to treat the case of South African democracy as but one example. In our context where democracy is, as, is at its teething stages, I would suggest, that is where corruption ran rampant across government and state-owned enterprises, and in the private sector with examples of Steinhoff as well as KPMG, for the previous decade, that was of course from 2000 and what is it, from the, the Cyril Ramaphosa has defined those the lost decade of the Zuma years, it might be useful to consider how COVID-19 could impact this young nation. 
And I call ours a teething democracy because in many respects, what we're still trying to do is that we're still trying not only to establish confidence, public confidence in public institutions, but we're also trying to establish, I suppose, the sustained rule of law in our country, which I, I would suggest in many respects is a challenge in the case of the histories that we've seen on the African continent. And here, I should not be misunderstood to be making any particular objection or any particular remark about any country. I am just stating the obvious facts, which is to say that public institutional confidence in public institutions on the African continent is something that we've seen as a bit lacking. And I, and I think in many respects, while South Africa's teething democracy uh, is trying to reestablish that public confidence at the moment under the Cyril Ramaphosa administration, there might be some concerns as a result of the kinds of decision-making that we saw from the executive arm of government or the executive branch of government rather uh, in the previous year. The lessons learned in our context might illumine the realities of other countries in my contention. To be sure, I call ours a teething democracy as we are now attempting to reestablish public confidence and institutional integrity in mechanisms designed to check and balance governance in and through the balance of powers. And here, those who are sort of familiar with political philosophy will go back to the Rawlsian conception of justice in terms of the overlapping consensus, which of course was adopted in South Africa, but I will get into this as I go along with my contribution. My analysis then takes its initial cue from Yuval Noah Harari when he thinks about the world after coronavirus. And this was a publication that he put out last year when of course we saw this really interesting move toward surveillance mechanisms that were used not only in South Africa, but across the globe. And I, we, and I wish to suggest that in many respects with a year or sort of a year later of this particular no novel coronavirus that we have, I think there are certain issues that we ought to think about critically and in terms of the global scene, certain aspects um, of what we've seen, for instance, between or necessarily in the uh, Israeli state could be as a result of the kind of mania of surveillance control, as well as the use of, of executive power using military force in many respects. But those are sort of questions that I will leave for us to consider and ponder, but merely just to touch on some of them as a way of sort of making my contribution today. So Harari makes a compelling argument for the dangers that lie unchecked in our agreement to be over surveilled and controlled, owing to the false dilemma we were given by our governments, a false forced choice between privacy and public health. In South Africa, this choice becomes an apparent tension between civil liberties and public health as indicated. Some would want to object to my framing of this apparent tension as a false one, owing to the implications wrought by the, by the pandemic on the lives of many across the globe. Now, for those who take on a more economic slant, we'll say necessarily that in some instances, the measures that we saw by our governments in terms of the uh, lockdowns that have been imposed all across the world were maybe a step too far. So that could be the first objection that could be posed necessarily. And I'm inclined to agree with that. But on a secondary level, I would suggest that if we understand constitutionalism effectively, ours would be to balance the two competing rights, which we were told in the case of South Africa, in any case, that public health trumped the right to privacy. Now, um, some would object, of course, to this particular tension as a result of the implications, as I say, which were wrought by the global pandemic across the globe, a matter to which I will attend in a moment. On the question of surveillance, Harari writes that it, and I, and I quote, signifies a dramatic transition from over the skin to under the skin, which of course highlights the dangers inherent with under the skin surveillance, Harari asks us to conduct a thought experiment along the lines of, and again, I'm quoting from him, imagine, the North, imagine North Korea in 2030, when every citizen has to wear a biometric brace, bracelet 24 hours a day. If you listen to a speech by the great leader and the bracelet picks up the telltale signs of anger, you are done for, close quote. In light of this, it might be useful to think through the philosophical and practical implications of the short-term decisions taken at the start of the pandemic. And here, 
The main idea, the main concept, the main thought for me is to say what are the out, what are the sort of outlasting implications? And again, we begin to see those in the sense of the kinds of strategies that have been deployed by certain governments as a result of the freedoms that they enjoyed in terms of exercising executive power because they were said they were supposedly acting on behalf of the citizenry. And a case in point here, I would suggest. And of course, I think there's some work to be done here in terms of linking the relationship between, as I said earlier, the tensions we saw in the case of Palestine and the state of Israel, as well as the decisions that were taken earlier in 2020 in response to the global pandemic. So, some, so in terms of highlighting these dangers, which are inherent in under the skin surveillance, he asks us to imagine this particular thought experiment. And he maintains that Many short-term emergency measures will become a fixture of life in the future in many instances. And, and here, again, I'm, I'm interested in how we're thinking about the future of democracy necessarily predicating it on this particular time of crisis that we have seen. Again, I'm thinking about South Africa, yes, but I'm also open to consider these implications as we have seen them play themselves out all across the globe. Um, this is the case, as we have seen it in South Africa, in terms of these long-term implications, where there has been, or we have, there have been constant extensions of the state of, of disaster, which allows for those who govern to curtail our liberties and freedoms at will, owing to their assessment of the public health crisis. And of course, here, there were a series of objections. I remember I was in conversation last year when these measures were being rolled out with the Deputy Speaker of Parliament, as well as the chairperson of the uh, public or the standing committee on public accounts. And the deputy speaker of parliament indicated to me and indicated to both myself, as well as the chair of the standing committee on public accounts, that in some respects, what we're asking for, what we were asking for as academics and as philosophers, this idea that we sit with and think through quite critically the decisions that were being taken, that that particular question or that particular uh, notion was overrated because, of course, we had to be responding in real time to an unfolding crisis of unprecedented measure. I am here reminded of the concerns that were first raised when such an approach to governance was announced in South Africa, right? This idea of the curtailment of the liberties of the citizenry or the polity as a result of a response to this public pandemic. With public thinkers, some public thinkers suggesting. Um, suggesting that we confront the reality that the government were ruling under a state of emergency. So in South Africa, we have, as I say, what we call the state of disaster, which was promulgated at the start of the pandemic. And of course, in many respects, some public thinkers and public intellectuals were in fact saying, actually, maybe it's not a state of disaster. Maybe it's a state of disaster in the sense that that is a language that will be more palatable to the South African public because of our history. Now, those who are familiar with the South African story will note that a, that a democratic government did not wish to align itself with said state of emergency owing to the crimes committed by the apartheid state under these particular conditions. That is of course a state of emergency, which we saw in the late 1980s. My concern for South African democracy lies with what I am perceiving to be an overreach of executive power, an overreach that has us present presently destined for a return to enlightened despotism. Now, as I have already used this concept, I here wish to take this time to define what is meant by this concept of enlightened despotism and how Hannah Arendt uses it in her own work. She suggests that Saint-Just, who had started out with the greatest possible enthusiasm for Republican institutions, was to add, the freedom of the people is in its private life. Let government be only the force to protect the state of simplicity against force itself. He might not have known it, but that was precisely the credo of enlightened despotism, right? So it's this curtailment of the public from engaging in public affairs. Moreover, taken with Charles I's speech from under the scaffold, enlightened despotism consists in having the government of those laws by which the people's life and their goods may be most their own. Tis not for having share in government, but as nothing pertaining to them. Now, again, this comes from Hannah Arendt and how she conceptualizes this idea 
of enlightened absolutism. The curtailment of the people's participation in public affairs, that is governance is at the heart of enlightened despotic rule, which ought to be checked and balanced by strong and enduring democratic institutions. And it might be useful here once again to take note of the fact that at the inauguration of the pandemic in the country, we saw a laxed kind of attitude from the oversight mechanism that is parliament and necessarily from this official opposition party who only came to question the realities or the decisions that were taken by the ruling party when we already had these two deaths of private civilians at the hands of law enforcement. So in some respects, there was a certain lull. And I would suggest that while the excuse is there, that it was, un it was an unprecedented time, and indeed we had to suspend some, some parts of public participation in our constitutional, in our constitutional democracy, I am of the view that that is a cop-out and that is an easy way out of the problem that we had ought that we ought to confront firstly as we stand right now, but more importantly, how we responded at the time and what that would necessarily mean for the kinds of social conditions that we subsequently create. While it might seem as though I am laboring the point, our constitutional democracies the world over hold that there are checks and balances in place that ensure and enforce oversight, accountability, and the exercise of democracy, subsequently securing our freedoms liberties and responsibilities. This is to say that constitutional democracies are predicated on the citizens participating in public affairs, an assumption that is premised on a vibrant and thriving public life. This position differs from that which holds that the freedom of the people is in its private life. And again, I'm going to quote, um, I'm going to quote here again from Hannah Arendt, who herself quotes from Charles I. So the, the freedom of the people is in its private life, as she suggests. Um, let government be only the force to protect the state of simplicity against force itself. And my own consideration in terms of thinking about this matter philosophically is to say, well, what happens when that force that is supposed to protect this private life is also the very same force that is used against the very same citizenry in a democracy? Such a public sphere, of course, that is that necessarily um, is constitutive of a, a, a vibrant public participation um, in public affairs is rooted in Rawlsian theory of justice that we have so well adopted, not only as a country post-democracy in 1994, but it has also influenced the thinking of scholars of political theory since the 20th century. In the course of this pandemic, we have seen not only in South Africa, but globally, emergency decrees and a move toward totalitarian style governance, a morbid reality that is reminiscent, of course, of George Olds 1984. These decrees in the Jewish state of Israel saw Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu authorizing the Israeli security agency to deploy surveillance technology normally reserved for battling terrorists to track coronavirus patients. Now we begin to see, I suppose, here the, the merge between technology and the use of artificial intelligence maybe, um, as well as, again, these systems that are supposed to protect the freedom of the people, as it were. And, and that's where the interest for me lies in terms of asking the question of how then do we understand the future of democracy? In light of this, I reiterate Harari's point that temporary measures have a nasty habit of outlasting emergencies, especially as there is always a new emergency lurking on the horizon. And my own suggestion here would seek to put the notion that this idea of the, I suppose, the decisions that are taken during times of emergency uh, have already begun to take root and to take effect all across our democracies, all across the globe. As we saw in the case of the United States, as I had indicated, even though the US is trying to gain, to regain, I suppose, the respect necessarily of public institutionalists or, or public institutions and the integrity of public institutions through the institution of democracy itself, that battle is a hard one to win because I suppose of the entrenched beliefs that we see coming out of that particular society, even to this very day, in terms of the decisions that were taken necessarily at the time of uh, the, the emergency as the public 
sort of public pan, public global health crisis was playing itself out, as well as prior to that. And so what I would like us to think about is how these particular actions and decisions necessarily have a kind of cascading effect. I would even venture um, a sort of a more contentious view to say, in many respects, the surveillance that we saw uh, in the case of the Palestinian state, or not the Palestinian, the Israeli state rather, subsequently resulted in the kinds of decisions or the kinds of political action that we saw being taken against Palestinians in the state of Israel, which of course sort of gave us that 11 day drawn out conflict that is now attempting to be negotiated. To me, this demonstrates the point, or to demonstrate the point rather, Harari remarks on the mania of control that ranged all the way to putting regulations, and this was back in the 20th century, again in the state of Israel, all in the name of emergency measures instituted by the state in 1948. The pudding regulations in Israel were only repealed in 2011, having been implemented in the 1950s. And in the case of, and, and, and what I'm trying to demonstrate here is I suppose the historicity of some of these ideas or some of these decisions that get taken under times of crisis, decisions that enable governments to necessarily go back to a problematic predisposition in terms of how they govern. Returning to the South African context for a moment with the deployment of the National Defense Force, I was and continue to be mindful and in support of the government's effort to contain the virus, limit mortality numbers from the outbreak, and protect the citizenry. I do, however, object to the control mania approach of the executive branch of government, an objection that is sustained or substantiated by the public outcry at the curtailment of certain freedoms of the citizenry. And we see this all across the globe in many respects with some more enlightened, not necessarily enlightened despots, but more enlightened leaders of democracy being very cautious about how it is that they approach this question of lockdowns. And we see this in the case, for instance, of New Zealand. To be certain, said curtailments were justified using the Disaster Management Act, which promulgated the national state of disaster in the country here at home. Furthermore, at the outset, I was deeply concerned by the suspension of checks and balances of democracy, which public intellectuals and constitutional law experts, or rather with public intellectuals and constitutional law experts, justifying the encroachment on our civil liberties with the false dilemma of the tension between freedom of movement and association and the right to life. And what I seek to suggest maybe is to say, as we apply ourselves further to a consideration necessarily of democracy and the future of democracy, how do we in future anticipate and possibly respond in very real ways to our understanding of a public health crisis, for instance, or any public crisis for that matter that would not give us this kind of apparent tension that we saw at the dawn of the global pandemic all across the globe. Okay. These are not either or options, I would suggest, but rather coexist and we seem to have forgotten this reality in lieu of despotic approaches. Again, going back here to the ideas of Hannah Arendt. After the reported deaths of two civilians at the hands of state officers, it seems only then that the nation reconsidered the decisions taken by our government. I would like to remind the reader that these justified precautionary measures were gladly welcome when the president announced them on Sunday, 22nd March, 2020. As South Africans justified the curtailment of our freedoms and in fact looked forward to them, I was concerned by the speed with which, our, by the, speed with which the executive were dispensing a plethora of regulatory mechanisms that go so far as to regulating funerals as gazetted in the notices issued on the 25th of March, 2020. I feared and continue to fear that the executive were creating conditions that will stress and, st and strain our democratic experiment. This fear is rooted in the undeniable reality that our check and balancing institutions endured a decade long attack that was premised on democratic derision and a desire for totalitarian control. I am pressed to consider, as any philosopher ought to, if this is the justification that the decline in ANC power and popularity was looking for in order to see the country move toward totalitarian rule. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean to say that in many respects, what we have seen in the country is a decline of ANC popularity. Now, some would say maybe that's a hasty move or maybe that's a hasty 
kind of assessment owing to the by-elections which we've just seen, local government by-elections which we've just seen last month. But my own suggestion is to, seeks to suggest rather that the high rate of unemployment with statistics just haven't been recently released, uh, which of course locates unemployment in South Africa at 50%, which is quite concerning. The stagnant economy, as well as the lack of development and state and looting of state resources is what has led to this kind of, I suppose, unpopular position of the ruling of the ruling party and government with the public. Now, as I say, it might seek to respond and say, actually, maybe my assessment is a bit too hasty. But I'm curious as to whether, in many instances, this particular global pandemic is what is not maybe possibly what could have given the ANC the justification for attempting, in many respects, to tamper with the democratic experiment. In this regard, I'd like to draw our attention to the framework of rulership as developed by Hannah Arendt. And this is a consideration of rulership vis-a-vis -vis the admission of all citizens to public affairs. She contends, and I quote, but rulership itself had its most legitimate source, not in any drive to power, but in man's wish to emancipate himself from life's necessity. And this was achieved by means of violence, by forcing the many to bear the burden of the few so that at least a few could be free. Now, in this instance, it's useful to, to, to think about the fact that Hannah Arendt addresses us in these terms, thinking quite necessarily about the relationship between freedom and revolution. And she begins, of course, by indicating that what we saw in, in real ways in terms of the kinds of approaches of governments, or rather the kinds of approaches of the polity from across all governments in the globe, was a move in real ways that sought to not only ensure the freedom of the people, right, in the sense of what freedom had meant for the people, in the sense that she even goes to say that freedom now meant the establishment of the happiness of the people to the extent that the concept of happiness as synonymous with freedom became a new concept or a new word in Europe. And what we see in the sense of freedom was this abandonment, I would suggest, by those who had pursued this freedom, an abandonment of the ideas of revolution, as it were. Now, continuing with this thought as she has it, now she indicates that for if violence pitted against violence leads to war, foreign or civil, violence pitted against social conditions has always led to terror. Terror, rather than mere violence, terror let loose after the old regime has been defeated and the new regime established is what either sends revolutions to their doom or deforms them so decisively that they fall back into tyranny and despotism. Now, in this instance, it is useful for me to think about how in thinking or rather in articulating the future of democracy in times of crisis, we attempt to institute or put in place mechanisms that do not take us back necessarily into this, or take us back rather, to tyranny and said despotism. And of course, here, I am in, I'm, I'm, in, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in how, um, what is it? I'm interested in how Hannah Arendt had conceptualized this notion at a time when the African continent necessarily was undergoing these kinds of freedoms and this kind of liberation that was being fought for in the 20th century. In terms of articulating to some degree the future of democracy as a result of having sort of painted this brief synopsis of what can, what I understand to be the role and function of the checks and balances, I would suggest that it might be useful for us to apply ourselves to the historical conceptions as well as articulations of democracy, right? So I would, I would suggest in many instances that the future of democracy lies in, the histori in its historical articulation. And here, I'm thinking quite necessarily of precisely the role and function of revolution as Hannah Arendt had suggested. And she says, as I said before, the revolution's original goal was freedom in the sense of the abolition of personal rule and the admission of all people to the public realm, their participation in the administration of public affairs. But rulership, of course, as I had indicated, had its most legitimate source not in the drive to power, 
but in many instances it had achieved it, it, it had achieved this in terms of the wish of man's of man's wish rather to emancipate himself from um, from um, the, the oppressions I suppose of life's necessity and this was achieved by means of violence and he said and she says here in conclusion that she wishes to indicate one more aspect of freedom which came to the fore during the revolutions and for which the men of the revolutions were least prepared and that is the idea that of freedom and the actual experience of making a new beginning in the historical continuum should coincide right so she understands the notion necessarily of a new beginning of a new dawn and this for me suggests i guess the idea of the future of democracy which is to say in order to steer clear of this enlightened despotism we ought to i suppose align as she indicates this new beginning with the historical continuum and she suggests here an alignment of the two she she indicates that let me remind you once more of the novice order cycle the surprising version of course is taken from virgil who in the fourth eclogue speaks of a magnus order cycle the great cycle of periods that is born anew in the reign of augustus and she indicates but he speaks of a great and not necessarily of a new order and it is in this oh, it is this change in line much quoted throughout the centuries that is characteristic of the actual experiences of the modern age and this is what i mean by this idea of an alignment i would suggest of the historical as well as aligning that with the future of democracy which is to say that the new order or the new beginning as it were ought to align itself with the historical conception of democracy which was this i suppose hope or desire to have the citizenry admitted into public affairs and in conclusion on my own thoughts how do we achieve this i had intimated towards this in my opening remarks earlier when i had indicated that in some instances public participation might necessarily seem or unfold as we had seen it historically but could possibly be viewed as something in a new form in the sense of the use of technology now there are two indications from no uh, what is it from yuval noah harari's work where he indicates that technology could be either used as surveillance as a surveillance mechanism or it could indeed be used as a form of this public participation that necessarily means that we are achieving the ends of democracy as we would have it and of course this is the coinciding here that hana arim speaks to in terms of the historical conception coinciding with the beginning of a new era in the 21st century whereby technology indeed facilitates our our participation in various platform and fora across the globe with myself situated in south africa as but an example at this very moment speaking to a number of people who might be tuning in from various contexts and from various aspects all across the world this indicates to me necessarily the emancipatory potential of technology in terms of articulating the futures of democracy which is to say articulating the public participation of the polity in democracy and and that for me is where the possibilities i suppose of democracy lie in times of crisis in terms of inaugurating a new beginning as opposed to facilitating a recession into tyranny and despotism thank you colleagues uh siseko can you hear me yes i can wow wow thank you I'm Thank going you, I'm going I'm going to just so you see then on on the screen look at this Oh wow thank you thank you very look. much Look at this Thank you very much Look at this Absolutely. And this which I believe you need to explain me what it means what is the Tuli Mandosela So the question reads um if if put on a uh, telemadoncela role and I do hope uh it's not a question it, it's telling you <laughs> just one thing is saying wow thank you thank you very much um I don't know what is telemadoncela I don't know what is that so she's she's the former public protector here in the country who's just received actually uh 
uh, one of um, the French highest uh, orders for her commitment necessarily to democracy and to justice, as it were. Um, so to 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 get such such a a a compliment is indeed quite humbling. Thank you very much, uh, Sam. Good. Very inspiring. And then you have a few questions at the at the top of this, uh, but you still saying things that were pretty aligned with your talk. They're, they're very, I, I, I don't even know how to, to summarize everything. I only have one word. It's, 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 I can still say, wow. <laughs> so, <laughs> so if, if I could just respond to, to the notion of a passive citizenry um, yeah. and a passive citizenry as ignorant, I believe the notion of passivity is one that we've seen cultivated over the years. Now, what do I mean by that? I seek to suggest that in many instances, the citizenry can either be jolted to participation or lulled into, I suppose, this kind of ignorance um, that Marira talks about in this particular comment. Now, how do we, I suppose, activate this public participation once more? I think it's in the kinds of conversations that we hold and the kinds of discussions that we necessarily approach. And I'm thinking of the work of Paulo Freire when he talks about this idea of a pedagogy of the oppressed. And for me, as, I, as a public education or as a, as a, as a public education and, 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 and I guess a, a, a public intellectual who is situated in a university context, I am quite keenly interested in how we conceptualize education necessarily working towards the ends of justice. And this, of course, I've articulated in some of my previous work whereby, for instance, just last year, I published on the notion of justice through higher education, revisiting the white paper three of 1997, which of course was a legislative framework here in South Africa that set up the new higher education sector moving into the democratic dispensation. Now in the preamble to that text, it is indicated by the then Minister of Education that higher education ought to serve the function of addressing historical injustices while necessarily attending to the needs of the new democratic dispensation in South Africa. Now, how do we do that? I believe we do that by tapping into that notion of problem-posing education that Hannah, not Hannah Arendt, sorry, Paulo Freire discusses quite systematically in The Pedagogy of the Oppressed, whereby he indicates that education in many respects ought to identify social problems and social questions and subsequently activate the agential capacity of the, I suppose, participants of the pedagogical process in terms of being responsive to those conditions and to those contexts. Now, how do we do that, I think? If, or how do we do that as just by an example? I think one of the interesting questions or one of the interesting things that we could possibly use, for, again, for those who are, interest, or who are familiar with the South African context, uh, you will know of the rolling blackouts that are titled load shedding by our national education, uh, national energy supplier, which is ESCOM here at home. Uh, as but an example, and this is just a meager example, for instance, uh, I was due to give this talk at home this afternoon, but because I was load shedded, which meant that I would not have been connected, I was forced to come into the office to do this kind of work. Now, problem posing education would necessarily facilitate a response to that very real problem, as it were, in the sense of in our teaching, in our research method, in our research methods, in the kinds of research questions that we are asking as public intellectuals, even not public intellectuals, but intellectuals themselves who are situated everywhere and anywhere in the globe, how do we in South Africa as intellectuals begin to inspire in our students questions to say, how is the quest or how is the reality of rolling blackouts necessarily inhibiting the kind of life in terms of public participation that we can have from the citizenry? And I would suggest that the kind of education that we've had in South Africa over the democratic dispensation is one that has facilitated the polity's complacency by, I guess, telling the idea to the public that they ought to be convinced and indeed satisfied with the lot that has been dealt to them by our government. And I would suggest that the role of the intellectual, the role of the philosopher, is to critique, question, and facilitate a way of seeing the world through a critical lens for the citizenry, so as to jolt the citizenry into this kind of public participation and out of this ignorance that Murira talks about. 
Um, and of course, indeed, I would, I'm, I'm in agreement here as well that there is a certain sense of distraction, a distraction that comes from the kind of public dissemination that, or public information dissemination that we have, those regimes that we have in South, in South Africa, but as well as across the globe. And my own recommendation would be to say, in those spaces that we occupy, in our communities of interest, in our communities of, in our social communities, in our social circles, how are we inspiring, how are we responding to said complacency and to said ignorance by the kinds of questions and conversations that we are curating and we're having with our fellow citizens? And so for me, there's an intimate relationship quite necessarily between education, the kind of questions that education poses in terms of the research that is conducted by public institutions, and again, not only here at home, but all across the globe, how that, how that education promulgates public participation in terms of using a problem-posing method of education and how that subsequently then jolts the public into this kind of public participation that I am suggesting here. And that process is quite achievable, taking into consideration the access that we now have to our governments. If you think about the fact that Parliamentary sessions are now live streamed in most instances because not all, parliament, not all parliamentarians can be in a chamber simultaneously owing to the social distancing measures that have been put in place by our governments as a way of trying to curb the spread of coronavirus. But there is a move, as it were, that I think we hadn't seen before, which we can tap into at this very moment, even though it is a moment of crisis. But every crisis, of course, presents us with opportunities. And ours is to ask ourselves critical questions of how do we tap into those opportunities and distribute information, information that necessarily concerns the lives of the public, the lives of the citizenry in general. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, Siseko, I want to close and wrap up this talk. It's been awesome. And I want to do it with three simple comments from people, and then we will move to the next uh, session. So I want you to read them uh, out loud. So everyone uh, can hear you read them, okay? So. so this is from David Glazer who says, I hope that this is recorded as well as live so I can share it with my friends, colleagues in Canada as well as in the United States. Thank you, David. Thank you very much for that. This is from Paul um, Frobisher, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, who says, brilliant, this sort of thinking is a rarity. Thank you, Paul. And the last one, is from Lasagne Brook or Lazanne Brook, sorry, who's um, who suggests that she's clapping out loud. Awesome contribution. Thank you very much, Lazanne. Thank you so so much for that. Thank you very much, Siseko. We will uh, share as people ask the live uh, recording as soon as it's available, so people can start sharing these. Uh, as we believe, as the audience that has been with you, which actually it's been around 458 people, uh, that is, should be shared all around the world. Gratitude, gratitude. Thank you very much, colleagues. And I wish you all a great day going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.